All right. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited because my dear, beloved teacher, mentor, friend, coach, extraordinaire, Kate Stillman is here today. Hello, beautiful, wonderful Kate. Thanks for having me, Pleasance. Um, I'm surrounded by all your things because I we're using Body Thrive for our year-long Ayurveda circle. And I had my husband print out the workbook for the master review. And I've read the book and then I have my notes. Fantastic. Because you Good are studentship. amazing in terms of your teaching materials. You're so prolific. You're able to really get amazing resources into people's hands. And you have such a beautiful way of doing it that helps people like me be able to push it into the world and work with people with your materials. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you are bringing to us. Do you have a copy of the book by you? Okay, um, will you start um, on page 183? Will you read to us from that first paragraph of ground your expansion to set the tone? And then you can tell us a little more about yourself and the book. But I want to hear in your words, this beautiful paragraph. Yeah, you bet ground your expansion. It's an appropriate pick pleasance for what's going on these yeah. days. Yeah. Your evolutionary journey is the path of being in the deepest joy, a state of enjoyment. The state comes from attentive, aligned effort. The yogis call this joy ananda, or awake to the field of bliss, which happens with more power in all five bodies spiritual, physical, breath, mind, and intuitive. As you've been developing the elements, you've been developing these five koshas or bodies. Space aligns to spirit, earth aligns to the body, fire aligns to the mind, air aligns to intuition, and water aligns to breath. I love it so much. It feels so relevant, right? Right now, people are looking for grasping for something to hold on to. So tell me a little bit about the, the birth of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm laughing because like any, any parent knows that uh, like there's the, there's the whole story behind the story behind, you know, like raising a child. And so Master of You is, it's not a baby. It's like a, it's a healthy teenager, right? So it's a brand or a new- wise elder. This is wise really- elder. <laughs> <laughs> it, so it, right? it was a course mm-hmm. and it is a course. I was actually just coaching members in it um, a moment ago. Actually, a member in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, was on the line with us. And the advantage of having a developed tribe that I've led for- over a decade, uh, closer to two, is that I have an experimental community. Mm -hmm. And this community is generative. So it generates ideas. It says like, okay, now that we have the habits of yogis, we have a lot of ideas, we have a lot of power, there's a lot we want to do in the world. We want to go deeper into Dharma. Like, how do you navigate Dharma? And how do you make more happen in the world? Like, how do you take something from an impulse like a positive impulse to have a positive impact and in the particular way that you want to. And how do you get that done? Like, how do you, you know, I think the new age term is manifest. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little less on the new agey side. Uh, Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) All the men coaches that you quote, I read all those books too. And I was like, there is a lot of wonderful male coach energy in here. (laughs) There's a lot of, yeah, because men, <laughs> yeah, men um, have been playing in the, they've been developing mm-hmm. the field of strategy mm-hmm. really well. And that's what happens. As soon as you want to make something bigger than you've ever done before, you can burn out. Uh, <laughs> and burnout is, is often um, ineffective strategy or not pivoting strategy quickly enough. Mm. And so that's where I put a lot of time and attention into like strategies. It's a discipline. It's a discipline the yogis have known about forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
it's all over the yoga sutras. Uh, and, and and there's also a lot of female energy in Master of You too, right? There's a lot of collaborative. Oh yeah, and the and the diagrams, the drawings, the spirals, the way in which we build things. There's the the underlying feminine energy for sure. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Like strategies, fire. It's it's masculine. It's not water. <laughs> <laughs> but, but a question that I have for you: when you bring together a lot of the modern coaching techniques and strategies and find them so deeply aligned with the Ayurvedic teachings, yeah. right? And the Vedic teachings. So tell me a little bit about that. Do they tend to work together? Do you find one over the other? How has that been for you in both books? I would say, or all your work. Yeah. So my foundation was in Ayurveda and mm -hmm. philosophy and yoga, asana, teaching and meditation and enlightenment uh, and yoga philosophy. So that's how I filter information. I think, you know, just mm -hmm. on the way that, I mean, I was raised as a Westerner and got a, a good solid college degree in international relations. And my brain naturally thinks of macro problems. And I devoted my life pretty early on to serving the planet and humanity uh, as a teenager. And like that, that never stopped. So like that was a bit of my foundation. And then like the overlay of Ayurveda and yoga was pretty thick and heavy for formative years of my young adulthood uh, into mid adulthood. And then I got into, and then I got into how do you scale an idea? Like how do you scale a community? How do you scale a business uh, and maintain a, a tribe, like a, like a really strong community around you know, and it, it, I would say almost like utopia in a way of like, how good can it be together if we all like lean in and transform and grow and, and become the, you know, the, the change we want to see in the world and have a direct impact and in, in the ways that we want to and whatever community actually means right now, because mine's online and offline and all the things. And that's how it is for most of us at this point. Mm -hmm. So like, where are your, so when I go to like a, when I'm listening to a business guy talk about strategy for three days, I can't not overlay right. that on a foundation of Ayurveda. And I'm like, oh, he doesn't know right now he's adding water, <laughs> but he's adding water. <laughs> yeah. And once you see the world through the elements or even through the doshas, even putting them together and seeing it, you can't not see it everywhere, right? It starts to become, and also I think it helps you attune more closely, obviously, to not just how you're caring for yourself, but how you're caring for your business or your neighbors or other people. And you can respond to them. Yeah. Right. If there's a tremendous amount of one of the elements or combining. So I think that's, I love that idea of seeing everything through that lens and then being able to digest and metabolize it and communicate it out in ways that people understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what I, what I really found with master of you and the more like, I mean, it was based on this awake living course that mm -hmm. uh, still is uh, in, in really getting like, how do you make something bigger happen? Or how do you still step, step mm -hmm. deeper onto your path of Dharma? Those are like the two problems we were trying to solve for in the community mm -hmm. and the text that arose around that. Like I didn't know when those questions were asked to me and it was mm -hmm. more or less my members coming out of living our Ayurveda course mm -hmm. who were like, how are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Like you seem to do whatever you want all the time. <laughs> can you, can you yeah, unpack me. that into a <laughs> curriculum? And I was like, yeah, sure. Sure. No problem. Why not? <laughs> and so then I started to tune in yeah. and, and to pay attention. And then, you know, and that's really what happened is I noticed like how the things that were really influencing me could be organized by element. And, and then what was actually harder pleasance was like figuring out in some ways, like the order of things, yeah, the krama of it. <clears throat> and I think krama, I think it can be spontaneous. I don't think like there needs to, it's not as like, it's not necessarily as, as um, strict as like a yoga sequence where you really wouldn't start with mm -hmm. a back bend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. might want to center yourself, maybe I warm up. I've been in one of those classes and I left pretty <laughs> quickly after. <laughs> but but yes. we did find mm -hmm. that if, if we, if we really pay attention, there's a reason that space always comes first in, mm. in all of the teachings, like presence comes mm -hmm. first. And I think right now in our, uh, 
in the, you know, in this current time that we're in, mm -hmm. a lot of people awaken to like, wow, I wasn't giving mm -hmm. my life enough space. Mm -hmm. And that was creating a lot of downstream problems for me. Downstream problems like yeah. my spending was out of integrity. Like we were right. buying stuff we didn't need or really want. Mm -hmm. We didn't even know what we had mm -hmm. before we would buy something. So then there was a, you know, lack of integrity with finances or savings or investment or actually being able to put money, which is just energy into that, what we really, really deeply wanted, or even having the space to mm -hmm. have the conversation in the investigation to find out what it is that we really wanted. There's this really cool question. Yeah. I love that didn't make it in the book. Um, cause I listened, cause I heard it afterwards, uh, by, uh, Harari who wrote Sapiens. And he, and he says, he ends at that book, which is a, a, a massive, amazing book, uh, with this question of like, what do you want to want? Mm. Right. And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. to keep going under, under there's so much there. There's so much there. Right? And so if there's not space and for so many people, they didn't have space. And if you don't yeah. have space, you don't have time. You don't get time without space. Right. And I think people are so used to fluctuating between the extremes that they're like, but I crash on Friday night, you know, or I sleep late on Saturday morning. And it's such a different approach. One of the things I wrote down was about the home um, on page 77 was really this beautiful description of the elements and the doshas in terms of how to think of your home. And I think this is really important right now while people are at home yeah. to consider these elements. So you said Bata types can ground their airy nature by sheltering themselves with a comfy and creative home and office, an office to soften the edges and invite relaxation with warm colors and fabrics. Kapha types should design an airy, more modern, minimalist home and office, spaces that feel expansive, organized, and energized with bright colors. And pittas thrive in a clean, calm home and office with plants and cooling. I'm laughing because literally yesterday I said to the kids, I just need you to take all the papers off the table and put them back in your room. Like, I was like, I knew I needed that, but it was such a pitta response to it. Like, just get this shit out of my face, you yeah. know, now. And then they, they, they just took it into the rooms. And I was like, ah, there I am. Yes. <laughs> you know? So I laughed when I read that. Oh yeah. So tell me a little bit about what, what right now, what people can do at home. This is, this seems to be a real foundation, right? If everything else is kind of yeah. overwhelming. I know it was really weird too. I just have to mention like when, uh, this book was released, like right when lockdown was starting and I was like, how, did, huh? Like, there, like it was before we were settled into it. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just like, what is mm -hmm. going like, what is going on? And, you know, there's some part of uh, the yogic path. There's some, some large part that has everything to do with space element of surrender where you're just like, huh, that's what's going on right now. And now it makes perfect sense. <laughs> like, right. Right. That's pretty amazing. Timing. Huh? Yeah. So my sense in saying this is that like, you're already doing it, y'all. It's like, just kick it up a notch. So mm. in this chapter, really does walk you through like the how to like how and the idea here isn't i mean it, there's a level of like marie kondo of like her brilliance was spark joy mm -hmm. her brilliance is like you your space should spark joy you should open a drawer and that should spark joy you should walk into a room and that should spark joy and that goes back to what, what you let in with which was ananda pleasance like ananda is the core it's, it's closer than your mind to who you really are is Ananda. Like your mind could be like three steps down, not yours, but like our, our human mind could be like three steps down into neurotic. And I use that term very loosely, right? <laughs> I, I use it in the, like the way the yogis use it in the yoga sutras. So it's like vrittis, like how much you're paying yeah. attention to yeah. the stuff that you shouldn't be paying attention to that blocks you from the bliss. Right. And so when we, when we piece these parts together, Kondo saying spark joy, the yogis are like your true state is Ananda. And so then all I do is bring in the Dharma element of saying like, okay, Ananda plus Ananda plus behavioral science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what behavioral science says is you can architect <laughs> your environment for who you want to become. Mm -hmm. 
and you, you're doing this, you're architecting your environment, whether you're doing it consciously or whether you're doing it unconsciously. And again, this all came from awake living, this course of we're looking at like, how do you live awake? Well, you live awake to your dharma and you use the five elements. So you use the space, you use akasha, you use your spaces to align and pull your dharma out of you. So what that means is when you, you know, open your drawer or you step into your closet or your office or your car or your kitchen, that you're being pulled forward into the habits of the person you want to become next. Mm -hmm. And to me, this was a foundational um, pivot that like, I think we've been tuned into as human beings forever, but the refinement in behavioral science around that, if you actually start from the outside in, it's easier. So if you wake up in the morning and you trip over your running shoes, it's going to be easier to put them on. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you open your cupboards and they're full of junk food, it's harder to say no. You're now setting yourself up for willpower. So what you want to do is architect your environment so you don't need willpower at all. Mm-hmm. And this to me is actually, if we look at the koshas, which you had me open with, and we look at that level of, oh, what happens when you can actually override the neurotic mind that's just going to perpetuate whatever you were doing yesterday, which might not be the behaviors you want to have tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Like how do we short circuit that track a little bit? And how we do it is we just architect our environment mm-hmm. to pre-select the behaviors that we're trying to step into or that we're, you know, our family is trying to step into. And I'll just give a little example and then I promise I'll shut up. No, no. This morning I, I, uh, I went into, we have a, an exercise room, a movement room is what we call it. And it has uh, a few machines. It's got a bike, it's got a rower. It's got a a huge gymnastics mat, like one of those like 16 by four foot monsters. It's got a balance beam. It's got four of my foam rollers. It's got a bunch of hand weights. It's got two yoga balls. Uh, It's got some free weights. (laughs) But when you, but like when you walk into it, it looks really neat and clean and there's plenty of space to move around. It's mostly mm-hmm. space. Oh, and it also has a yoga mat. That's like an eight by 10 foot yoga mat. Mm. <laughs> One of those extra that's thick. Nice. <laughs> so I walked in this morning and I realized like, okay, with shelter in place, we're using this space a little bit differently now than it was being used a month ago. Mm-hmm. And so I update my spaces at least probably monthly. It's, I'm, I'm hyper aggressive with this because I have <laughs> like you with the papers and the kids, like yeah. I probably have that to an abnormal degree. Yeah. <laughs> and because I'm very awake to my own becoming, right? Yeah. As you are yeah. too. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. I get how this works. Yeah. The, the rules changed last week. There's no school. There's no yeah. this, there's no that. So then home has to change to reflect mm-hmm. that. So that's all I did. Like there was a medicine Buddha in the exercise room. He moved to the front hallway. Mm-hmm. He's just chill up there. He's a big mm-hmm. guy. Um, there was a bunch of like meditation type stuff up there, but like I redid my bedroom, which is huge to be a healing space. Cause I'm recovering from knee surgery mm-hmm. and we moved a couch so I can elevate my leg and ice it and do my little, um, <laughs> ultrasound on it and all the things that had to get shape shift so that that could be a really high functioning healing space, which opened up the space where the couch used to be where we moved the rug. And now Indy and I, who's 12, we do partner yoga there, which is really weird because I have a big body and she has a small body and we're figuring it out. But now we have plenty of room to figure it out, mm-hmm. which meant that all the meditation stuff could leave the exercise room and the Buddha could move to the front hall to welcome mm-hmm. everybody. And there's just more room for the, everything to get off the floor in the exercise room. Mm-hmm. And it sounds so simple, but when, you, but when I walk in there now, it's clear that that's not a space to meditate, yeah. right? And it's clear in the bedroom that that's a space for healing and partner yoga as well as sleeping. Yeah. So it's little things like that. Profound. It makes such a difference, an energy shift, the season changing. And even with, with all the stuff, the shelter in place, the season changed anyway, even if you'd already done spring cleaning, this is a different season again, right? So you need different things, the workspaces. And I think it seems so simple that people take it for granted energetically, how draining it is to have dusty spaces or not, um, or spaces in your home that you're not working with or that are not really balancing your, your constitution or the elements that are so present, right? If you have a lot of, um, Vata nature and there's just stuff everywhere, you know, I find that makes my son really anxious. He doesn't know what toys to play with. There's too many options and he just shuts down. So he, we have to kind of continue to clean that stuff out. It really does make a difference. Um, 
I wanted to ask you a little bit about to the, the sort of Ayurvedic clock right now and like rituals and routines for people because they are home and there seems to be a little rebellion and resistance towards keeping up with some of those routines. So on 147, I'm also referring the page numbers for people who listen so that they can go to that. You have a good description of that, but I just want to touch on that. Yeah. So, I mean, the way that we're probably seeing it now, and I'll just talk about a concept um, from, from some guy strategists from Adams and Anderson of mastering leadership and scaling leadership that they talk, uh, they both studied a lot of evolutionary principles with uh, Ken Wilber and they, they picked up on a concept and they, they brought it into like the, as few succinct words as possible, which I love and makes it easy to quote. Mm-hmm. And that is structure precedes evolution. Mm-hmm. So we structure the way that our habits are structuring our day, that that gets set. And what the yogis will say in that is like, that becomes, that becomes your, your behavioral pattern, that becomes your personality, that becomes your ego. And then the mind defends the ego. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the problem with that is like, if you're staying up late and you're watching Netflix because there's no school tomorrow and like work is pretty flex these days mm-hmm. and you can kind of squeeze it in wherever you want mm-hmm. and might as well have some ice cream because it's movie night again. And then you're, you're, you have a structure in place that's creating uh, an experience, right? And so what I look at is like, if we want, if we want to have, a, if we truly want to have an evolution, we need to put a, a structure in place that can uphold that evolution. So if, if we were going against, and this is where the Vedic clock really is. Um, what I find is it's, it's grounding for people mm-hmm. to know that, that mm-hmm. there's these energies. We're all familiar that the sun's highest in the middle of the day, that the sun sets in the afternoon. And then there's a different feeling mm-hmm. in the air. There's a different feeling in our emotional body of after sunset. Then there's in the middle of the day. There's a different feeling right when we wake up compared to right when we go to sleep, you know, and just starting to tune into like these energies exist and these energies actually are a structure unto themselves. Mm -hmm. And if we match our behaviors with the structures of the, of the natural energies Mm -hmm. of life here on planet earth, what happens is we fall into rhythm. It's not a striving for rhythm. Uh, Dr. John (laughs) Duyard does a good job talking about like you go with the flow of the current instead Mm -hmm. of paddling against the current. And this is where like in courses, like I lead and you lead where people find that they, like the weight just falls off. Like we had a member in Body Thrive uh, who's been living the clock, living these habits. Mm -hmm. She joined, she's pretty, uh, let's see, she's probably about 60 years old, Mm -hmm. early sixties, heavy and kapha. And she learned about the dosha clock of just like, hey, you know, humans are designed to eat earlier. You know, when the sun's higher in the sky, we have stronger digestion. As the sun's going down, our power of digestion goes down. Uh, Go to bed early so you can wake up early. Hydrate with water. Space your meals. You know, eat eat so that you're hungrier to eat a good meal somewhere in the middle of the day, somewhere between, you know, 10 and five. Yes. And yeah, my first book, Body Thrive, yeah, like yeah. just buy that, do that. <laughs> just do the, just do these little, yeah. these little basic things. So we're <clears throat> on call number seven, which means we're seven weeks in to a mm-hmm. year long journey. And, she, and she, this was like before total lockdown. So it was maybe it was like a couple weeks ago. And she's like, my sister took me shopping yesterday. This is on like a big coaching call. There's like 50 yeah. people in the room, right? Oh, really? Why'd she take you shopping? Well, because my pants don't fit. Well, why do my pants not fit? Well, because the weight's falling off. So this is what falling into rhythm Mm -hmm. is like. Mm -hmm. It just falls away. The imbalances Mm -hmm. fall away because the rhythm is strong. And when the rhythm's strong, we're in all five bodies naturally because we're attuned to the plane of spirit. We're attuned to our intuition. Our mind is aligned to our higher goals because we're attuned to intuition our energy body is telling us to move and when to eat and when to poop and, and we're doing these things or when to change the conversation or take ourselves for a walk or when to, you know, do mm-hmm. a bunch of jumping jacks or behave like a kid and run around. Right. And I do these things. I, uh, we fall into balance. And when, if we're not feeling that, if we're feeling disconnected in our own bodies, it means mm-hmm. to me that there's just part of the ease of the rhythm that we're living against. And so now we're a rhythmic or what the yogis might say, we're out of sequence or a Krama. 
-hmm. We're living against the sequence of nature. Whenever you do that, you will hurt yourself. Like Mm -hmm. at any level, it could be mental, physical, emotional. Can you talk a little bit about people who take it too far? Because where, you know, we are in a very competitive pit on nature culture in DC, as you know, you used to live here. And there are people who, you know, it's so, it becomes so rigid and yeah. they have to meditate and they have to do this or the system, um, it gets really anxious. There might be an overload. They sort of stop relating to others. Have you ever seen that happen? Yeah. Sort of, oh, yeah. How do you adjust that? Yeah, it's to me it's pretty simple. Uh there's a bigger why. So it, when it, and this happens it happens a lot like just like you described pleasance like where someone who's naturally intense, um naturally focused mm-hmm. and naturally disciplined mm-hmm. picks up on like oh there's rules. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to I'm going to get an A on the rules. I'm going to live the rules. And but the problem is like what were the rules for? Mm-hmm. Right. So if the, for me, like there's a, I have a, I have a, just a very strong current of like, I'm here to help people like wake up and live their best life. Mm-hmm. Because when we all do that, the world becomes a much more interesting place. We take better care of ourselves. We take better care of our ecosystems. We train our children to do the same, their potential skyrockets. And we're out of the box. Like we're out of our boxes around like, who am I? What should life look like? So the rules, these are not human rules. These are just tuning into the natural elements. Mm -hmm. They're not human. It's not even, I mean, you could say like humans are translating these into rules, but like try to get, try to get beneath the words and feel the energies. And when you feel the energies, just notice like, oh, it feels good when I feel that energy at the end of the day go down Mm -hmm. and I don't fight it. Like I let myself receive it because mm. I'm not jacked up on caffeine and sugar and I haven't eaten too much food <laughs> right? and I'm not mm-hmm. distracted from whatever cool shows mm-hmm. on Netflix, <laughs> right? Like mm-hmm. I'm just tuning in to like it's mm-hmm. sunning, it's sunsetting. We're voting emotions. That's a huge piece right now. Yeah. Like yeah. just feeling. Yeah. And then when we feel that we feel in the morning, we're like, Oh, I feel the sun rising. Mm-hmm. I tell myself what time to wake up before I go to sleep. And my mm-hmm. body just wakes up then. Mm-hmm. Right. If I'm like 4am or 5am mm-hmm. or 6am. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the point is, is like, what's the, what's the bigger why? What's mm-hmm. it all in service? What's it all in service of? I'm clear mm-hmm. on my why. The more the person mm-hmm. who's obsessed with the rules or the perfection gets clear on like the, what is that in service of? And then mm-hmm. can I, now that I've got, and, and we, in the ethos part of a wake of a master of you, there's aim for a solid B minus. And mm-hmm. in my community, <laughs> like this is the mm-hmm. favorite because mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. get a lot of perfectionists yeah. and they, you know, sometimes in business is called fail in startup business called failure to launch mm-hmm. where you're aimed at perfection <laughs> and, and you fail to actually hit the, hit the mission critical. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to get so obsessed in our habits or so obsessed in what our body should look like because that's where a lot of it's coming from people. Mm -hmm. My body should look like this. And if I do these practices, then this is what I'll Mm -hmm. look like. Or if I do these practices, Mm -hmm. then this is what I'll feel like. And it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's training wheels. Like Mm -hmm. that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a B minus with it. And then you get onto a bigger thing. So now the practices are actually just in service of a bigger thing. And they're not for the end result in themselves. Mm -hmm. It's such an important part, the B minus, the working with it and the, and the why aspect, because there's so much in wellness culture that makes good meditation is good. Yoga is good. It means you're a good girl. You're, you're good. If you meditate, you're good. If you drink green juice, you're good. Instead of asking yourself really attuning to what is happening with my body and this relationship that I'm in with this food or this drink or this practice, you know, if you have a lot of trauma and and uh, anxiety right now. I don't know that sitting alone quietly and meditating is the right thing for some of our, you know, some of the people that I've been talking to and that I know are really experiencing a tremendous amount of um, grief and 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 suffering. Yeah. <laughs> so not necessarily do I want to put you in a corner and say sit quietly alone and with your thoughts that are yeah. <laughs> leading you down a dark alley. You know, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm always, you know, wanting to push on that questioning piece for people's lives. Um, I want, I'm mindful of your time, so I want to close, but I want to ask you in closing what you really want people to hear. I want, of course, everyone's going to get the book in our community. We are going to use it for, we were going to use it for summer school, but because this is happening 
again, now we're doing a new earth. So we may use it right after a new earth. It might be a great follow-up um, and use the workbook. And I just really want people to hear from you, from your heart. What do you want them to take away from this book and take away from these practices? Yeah, like I said earlier, like live your best life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and use this, the strategy section is the hardest part in this book. Mm. And it's, it's there, it's there for a reason, you know, it's there mm -hmm. so that you realize that like there's strategy to living your best life, to designing your mm -hmm. best life. And, and for those of you who are very impact driven, like I am, that like there's, there's a real strategic way to, to use your finite self um, to create infinite impact. Yeah. And this is such a beautiful roadmap um, to that and to revisiting things that you may have used before and then building a little strategy and a year long, you know, a plan for yourself. Um, I want to thank you so much for everything that you put into the world. It's such, Aww. it's such a gift, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, especially because in the fall, I went to a live training with you and we used the liberating structures model, which I have completely devoured and introduced to American university. And we're doing trainings there now at AU on liberating structures. Sweet. And it is such a powerful tool for the classroom and for, um, self empowerment in the classroom and in learning. And so thank you for that huge gift. You really, really gave that to me as well. Um, will you close with the reading on page 189, the beautiful words of closing? You can start or end wherever you want in that beautiful closing poem there. You bet. You are the cosmos. You are the cosmos that created you. You create via the five elements out of possibility towards excellence. You are the magic and the myth. You are the hero and the journey. And yet, you are ordinary. You lead an ordinary life like the rest of us. And yet, you are extraordinary. Even in the hustle bustle of today, you remember you and the creator are one, the same. The five elements are your powers to shape yourself and your cosmos. You design you for the next chapter of Dharma. You hear opportunity knocking. You become a beacon for those around you to unearth their deeper dreams, fire up their ambitions, discover their inner rhythm, free their time, unleash their flow. In your experiments, you are an inspiration to those around you of being and becoming like the cosmos, both at ease and ambitious. You wield the elements and grow in ever increasing integrity and capacity. You shape your world. You choose your next identity in shapeshift. You are a master of being and belonging and becoming a master of you. Activated with the wisdom of the elements, you lead us. Thank you, thank you. Thank oh, you. you're welcome. We almost, we, we, that originally started at the beginning of the book. Really? But we thought we'd freak out all the people that weren't new agey enough. <laughs> I think it was the perfect ending to really inspire to go back and do the work and the workbook. It's so awesome. Oh, thanks. What a Pleasant. gift. I what appreciate gift. it. You're a treasure. Love ya. Thanks Love for you everything. Too. You betcha. Bye, Bye. y'all.